Thank you very much, sir, for the uh, kind introduction. So, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Neeta and Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, for having me here today. And I'm going to be talking about how can we revive and preserve the beta cell clinical implications. So, we all know that the human pancreas has about 1 million islets and each islet contains about 1,000 or so beta cells. We also know that each beta cell can hold about 200 to 250 units of insulin as storage capacity, which for an average individual without diabetes is about 10 days supply. But if you look at beta cell function, as glycemia worsens, so if you go from normal glucose tolerance to pre-diabetes to type 2 diabetes, what you clearly see is a gradual but steady decline in the beta cell function. So there are many factors for this age is a very important factor. But if you look at beta cell mass, and that's the line there, what you see is that up to say almost nearing diabetes, absolutely nothing happens to beta cell mass, after which there is a rapid decline of the mass as well as the function leading to depletion of insulin. So now what causes these? Primarily it's related to endoplasmic reticulum stress and the reasons for this could include glucotoxicity, glucolipotoxicity, inflammation, autophagy, islet amyloid, etc, etc. So now we know that there are two things that we're talking about, beta cell function as well as beta cell mass. Now this is DeFranzo's famous paper that came out in 2009 where he showed exactly the same thing. So if you go by diagnosis of diabetes, the 2 hour cutoff that we have is 200, right? So that's what you see on the x-axis here. Look at beta cell function. By the time you reach 200, almost 80% of beta cell function is actually lost. Even if you look at the stage of IGT, about 50% of function is lost. Now, what about in Indians? This is data from the DCLIP study, which is uh, done at MDRF in collaboration with Emily. And what we've done here is we've plotted insulin resistance along with beta cell secretion. So as you can see with progression of glycemia, as you move from NGT to diabetes, as insulin resistance clearly takes a peak there, you can see the plummeting of the beta cell secretion. So clearly there is a separation between the two. Now what is it that we're talking about here? So we said, okay, function is going away, mass is going away. So what's happening? Why are these beta cells disappearing? So initially the thought was all of these beta cells were dying and there was this apoptotic mechanism that was responsible for it. But today we know that there is new evidence that has come in to say that actually it's not apoptosis but stunning that is going on. So what exactly do we mean when we say stunning? The central player in all of this is a transcription factor called as FOXO1. Now in the healthy beta cell, you can see the yellow one there, that's the healthy fellow with the blue nucleus, this FOXO1 is present in the cytoplasm. What does FOXO1 do? It is responsible for looking at signaling as well as insulin secretion. So it's sensitive to glucose and insulin release. It's also related to beta cell mass. So it seems to be the critical transcription factor. Now when there is a metabolic stress, and we've discussed all the causes, glucotoxicity, glucolipotoxicity, etc. When there is a prolonged metabolic stress, what happens is that this FOXO1 gets downregulated. So what happens? It moves from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. When this FOXO1 moves into the nucleus, there is an immediate dip in insulin secretion. Now what happens, in order for the body to prevent this insulin secretion from coming down, other transcription factors try to make up. These include the PDX, the NKX6.1 and MAFA. So these guys move from the nucleus into the cytoplasm in an attempt to keep the insulin secretion going. However, these transcription factors can be used as a biomarker because if you see these guys, you know that there is imminent beta cell failure or decrease in insulin secretion. So now what happens? Now the metabolic stress is continuing. FOXO1 went to nucleus, other transcription factors came out with continued metabolic stress. FOXO1 disappears. Once FOXO1 disappears, insulin secretion becomes nil. 
all other transcription factors which I just talked about, all this and FOXO1 together are what the make the beta cell a beta cell. All of these guys disappear. So what happens, the beta cell is no longer secreting insulin. In fact, it has even lost the characteristics of a beta cell. It undergoes the process what we call de-differentiation, which means it starts expressing other transcription factors and it becomes a progenitor cell. Okay, so this process is what we call de-differentiation. Sometimes what can happen, instead of becoming a progenitor cell, it can become an alpha cell. Okay, so all the transcription factors vary, there's all the different things on the side here. It can become an alpha cell and this process is called as transdifferentiation. So what we know now is metabolic stress, FOX1 disappears, insulin depletion and the beta cell goes into a state of stunning, which means it's not dying, but it's getting de-differentiated into a progenitor cell or getting transdifferentiated into an alpha cell. And that's what we see here. Healthy beta cell, due to metabolic stress, it's getting all messed up, the internal things of the beta cell. So it gets de-differentiated or trans-differentiated. Now, up to this point, okay, there is only functional damage. Nothing has actually permanently happened in the beta cell. So if at this point, you can remove this metabolic stress, all of these are 100% reversible. And this is the process that we call stunning or reversal of this stunning. Okay, so the beta cell is not gone anywhere. It's only differentiated and staying there. If you remove this test, it can actually become a normal beta cell. We see all of the beta cell transcription factors come back. Insulin secretion comes back and it is restored to normalcy. An important point here is that in the process of redifferentiation, that means going back to being a beta cell, the first thing that happens is before the ability to sense glucose, the beta cell becomes sulfonylurea responsive. So, you take off the stress and the beta cell is recovering. First thing that happens is sulfonylurea responsibility, which is a good thing. After that, with more rest and more recovery, it becomes glucose sensitive. Okay, so this is the process of how the beta cell recurs, uh, recovers. However, if the metabolic stress does not go away and continues, then slowly all these cells start dying. And then there is beta cell apoptosis, the beta cell mass irreversibly is gone, there's permanent beta cell failure and thus permanent insulin dependence. And thus there are two parts to this, the functional damage which is reversible and the structural damage which is permanent. So now let's look at strategies for beta cell preservation. So obviously good glycemic control, removing the metabolic stress is the way forward. There are multiple therapeutic strategies for this. There's no one way that's correct. However, there are some ways that are recommended. Now early initiation of insulin is certain, certainly one of the means by which, it, by which you can make the beta cell recover and I'll show you some evidence for that in a minute. Other than that, the lifestyle programs that we have, the large DPP, the Indian d -clip, all of these, and of course we have many other drugs and techniques. Now lifestyle. So we, this is the large US-based DPP or diabetes prevention program. What did they do? All over the US, they took about 3,000 people, put them into three groups, one that got only lifestyle, these are all high-risk people without diabetes. They put them onto lifestyle intervention, they put them onto metformin and a combination of the two and looked at incidence of diabetes. And what did they find? That lifestyle had the best benefit in prevention of diabetes, right? So reduced risk of incidence. However, for this talk, what is important is that they found that the lifestyle improvement, uh, lifestyle intervention also had the greatest improvement in insulin sensitivity and the best beta cell preservation function even after one year compared to the metformin group even. So they found that there was a sustained uh, effect at one year uh, with the lifestyle group and they said that the better effectiveness of the improvement program could be due to this uh, preservation of the beta cell. So you know now that lifestyle has a kind of role in uh, removing the metabolic stress. What about the Finnish DPS? Uh, similar results here again. What they found was that the weight loss achieved 
with the lifestyle intervention also improved the insulin sensitivity and had beneficial effects on better preservation of beta cell function. So again, the data that's come from two different groups. Now what about India? This is data from a group which did the DCLIP study and this uh, stands for the Diabetes Community Lifestyle Improvement Program. What did we do for about 600 individuals? We randomized them into those who uh, received lifestyle, all of them had pre-diabetes and were obese. And we randomized them into those who would receive the lifestyle intervention or control. And here we found that overall there was a 32% reduction in incidence of diabetes. And this paper came out in Diabetes Care in 2016. However, subsequently, we've had a paper just accepted four days ago, I think, uh, wherein we have shown in those who did the lifestyle intervention, there is a sustained increase in adiponectin, decrease in uh, ghrelin, all the cytokines, and an increase in ghrelin as well, the PYY, sorry, uh, for these people who had the lifestyle intervention as compared to controls, and this was sustained at one year. Now what about insulin? Early insulin initiation with appropriate dose titration may protect against the pro progress of beta cell dysfunction. It may also alleviate the glucotoxicity and the lipotoxicity which of course we know affects the beta cell adversely. So what does it do now? It is now at this point that if you give insulin, this whole cycle can be broken. And we know that this is the most effective means to actually break this cycle. Now what about the evidence? This is a randomized controlled trial that came out in the Lancet in 2008 where they looked at three mediums of looking at this first early initiation of insulin. So they did CSII, they did MDI and they gave oral agents as initial initiation for newly detected diabetes. You can see that the numbers are kind of similar. The age is similar, it's an RCT so it's all quite well matched. The BMI is similar and the baseline A1C is also superb. So 9.8, 9.7, look at that. There's no difference between the groups. So well, extremely well matched. Now what about the percentage achieving euglycemia? Well, it's much better with the insulin, but with the oral agents. But even with the oral agents, you have a very good uh, percentage that has achieved euglycemia. So not really worried uh, even about even there. But now I'd like to draw your attention to these two columns here which is the acute insulin response, the ability to secrete insulin. So in the first group, look at it, 951, 800, 831. So superb. All three again are equally matched. No difference. Whichever way you did it, there's no difference. However, look at what happens to this AIR at one year. 951 became 809. 800 became 729. But look at the oral agents. 831 became 335. So this is again what is happening secondary to failure to OHA. So you give OHA, it has fantastic response, but over time this response is diminishing, meaning that the beta cell is failing at this point in time. So obviously insulin has the more sustainable uh, effects. This is a patient from our group. He was a 53 year old male. He had eight months duration of diabetes with central adiposity. He was on glycoside, 80 mg PD, and with that his sugars were totally uncontrolled. Fasting was 217, PP was 344, A1C was 11.4. We started him on short-term insulin along with uh, cetagliptin, glycoside, and metformin. Four weeks later, the insulin was stopped and the oral agents were continued. So what actually happened? Well, in two months' time, the uh, A1C came down from 11.4 to 7. So you might say, okay, nothing surprising, he was on one drug, you made a three drug, that is insulin, he once he came down. Okay, that's common sense. But then, you look at the C-peptide here, what you see, look at this is the uh, level at which the C-peptide, the beta cell was stunned. Okay, the A1C was so high, there was glucotoxicity at that point, it was 0.9 and 1.6. But just see in two months, what has happened, the insulin secretion has beautifully picked up, especially the stimulated has beautifully come back almost to normal levels and thus you see a reversal of study. So this is the concept of functional recovery of beta cell and recovery from beta cell stunning. So this is just one patient, this is a bit of an old slide. Today we have a whole series 
uh, in whom we can demonstrate this. Uh, this is another kind of meta-analysis that looked at exactly the same thing and they showed that with insulin, there was preservation of beta cell function even 3.5 years down the line. Now, what about oral drugs? We talked about this before, sulfonylureas, beautiful response in glucose lowering, but then everything goes away because the insulin secretion comes down. With pyrazone and rosiglitazone, there is a sustained effect here as far as the beta cell is concerned because glucose comes down, but then there is a sustained improvement. And therefore, glitazones are clearly superior to sulfonylureas. However, they do have side effects which limit their use sometimes. This is another one that is very similar to our study. It's a meta-analysis that looked at metformin in comparison to pyrazone and cetagliptin. And they showed that metformin had the best beta cell preservation as compared to any other drug. And in combination, metformin and cetagliptin had the best kind of uh, effects in beta cell preservation. It's a meta-analysis of all the studies. Incretin based. So incretins have direct effects on the beta cell. They also have effects on neogenesis by making the pancreatic ductal cells become beta cells. They also have indirect effects. So these are from uh, mice models in which you can look at islet morphology. You will see that the GLP treated ones have preservation of the islet cells even after a period of time. So blue is, I mean green is insulin, red is glucagon. When you have diabetes, decrease in insulin, more of glucagon. If you treat with GLP-1, you can see the preservation of the beta cell and insulin secretion. This is a lot of studies on cetagliptin with beta cell preservation and it does have a positive effect alone and as in combination with metformin. Bildagliptin shows you pretty much the same thing, increased insulin secretion and preservation of the beta cell. I'll just summarize by saying that beta cell function and mass decrease with time and with worsening glycemia. However, the concept of beta cell stunning gives you hope. With chronic metabolic stress, the beta cells can either de-differentiate or trans-differentiate. However, this is reversible in the short term. There is a concept of redifferentiation or recovery. Lifestyle modification has been shown to be useful. However, over time, we do not know whether this will be preserved. Metformin, glitazones, GLP-1 and dpp 4 have proven efficacy in improving beta cell function. However, insulin and even short-term insulin is the best solution for long-term beta cell preservation. Thank you very much. I think uh, this team was, uh, you know, uh, uh, known to us that uh, uh, there is well progression of beta cell. That, that's what diminution of beta cell. Now we look at if you can have the levels of toxicity and glucotoxicity, then we can handle the solution. So we can have one or two short questions at the time. Thank you, for a nice presentation. Now, my question is that you were one patient who was on glycogite and uh, other things. You started using it for a very short period of time and it was there in Calcutta. But why did you continue glycogenic for one month period? Had it been not better with only insulin and metformin and dpp And what insulin you used? Is it a uh, insulin? So those are good questions. So first let me take the sulfonylurea one. So usually what happens is you can actually stop the sulfonylurea when you're doing short term insulin. This particular patient, it had been continued. But usually you can stop the insulin and in fact you can stop all drugs for the period of one month because what will happen otherwise, you will end up in hypoglycemia. When you start three drugs and insulin, there's usually, and because you have to keep up titrating the insulin also. So the best way to do it perhaps would be to do the insulin alone and then restart the drugs. But practically, sometimes there are a lot of issues with that. So there is no harm in continuing the sulfonylurea because when the recovery happens, and the recovery can happen quite soon, within two, three weeks it can happen, the sulfonylurea responsibility, the responsibility is the first to come. See, glitazone is going to take time to act. TPP4 also has its own kind of action. But the sulfonylurea will start acting very soon. So by the time the insulin effect wears away, the sulfonylurea urea would have picked up. So by the, you will see a lowering of HbA1c that is durable when you keep the two. So the answer to that is you could have taken it off 
you could have continued the metformin and the rest of it, the DPP-4. But if you keep the sulfonylurea, nothing wrong because the sulfonylurea sensitivity picks up also. So that's uh, it's so that's one of the things. What was it? Uh, what insulin you used in this patient? Is so so in this so usually we start basal insulin if we are starting with oral drugs as well. But I think in this particular patient, it was a premix that we used. Thank you very much. Well, excellent presentation as usual. One question. You know, the ADA just now, ranting lecture was on the Fox over the top. And at the end of his lecture, he said, by 2022, we will have a cure for diabetes. Do you throw some light on that? Based on Fox over the top. Um, so I think there is some work, I didn't attend the Banting lecture, but I heard about it. Um, well, I, uh, I think it has something to do with uh, the FOXO1 and the other transcription factors. There are also some work being done on cytokines along with this. So there is already, you know, alkyl drug, recombinant IL1 beta. So this has something on beta cell apoptosis. So apparently by giving 100 milligrams of this anakindra subcutaneously once a day, you're able to preserve or rather deplete apoptosis and preserve beta mass. So I think something like that is being planned with the transcription factors and FOXO1. I'm not directly sure what work exactly is being planned that again. Last question. In pre-diabetes, uh, there's a lot of studies. Which study? For what? Yeah, so pre-diabetes, the easiest thing to do is lifestyle modification. That should be more than enough. Uh, of course, if you find progression, adding money. So clinically, there's no change as far as pre-diabetes goes. What would you do if you found someone with pre-diabetes? You put them on a lifestyle modification program. The same thing today also has beta cell preservation. Now, if you have an IFG plus IGD, what would you do? You would start metformin. We now know that metformin also has effects on beta cell preservation. So we know that whatever we were doing so far, as far as pre-diabetes goes, that's fine. You're not going to change much. But in terms of diabetes, where we make a mistake is that there's often clinical inertia in starting early insulin. And I think that is the message that comes from talks like these, wherein in a newly diagnosed patient, Early onset type 2, one must start early insulinization for a short period, 3 weeks, 4 weeks, up to 3 months, whatever you think is necessary. That can help in beta cell preservation in the long term, even if you are using sulfonylures. So thank you, Anja, for a very wonderful talk.